welcome everyone and a happy new year. Um, my name is Miriam Bradella. I am a professor of radiology at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and I'm really excited to welcome you to the Society of Skeletal Radiology Resident Education Club webinar. Um, I will be serving as a moderator for the session. I would like to remind you to you that we're going to use poll everywhere and we will put you saw the instructions on the slides earlier, but we will also put it in the chat function. So now it is my great, great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker. So we are very honored to have Dr. Angela Atinga, who is a staff MSK radiologist at Sunnybrook Health Science Center and an assistant professor in medical imaging at the University of Toronto. She's also a member of the university's imaging department research committee and a member of the SSR research committee. Her special interests are in multimodality imaging of MSK pathologies with a special interest in the application of AI and machine learning methods to MSK radiology. Um, just before we start, please um, put your questions in the chat, which I will moderate, and then there will be several cases with questions at the end, with Poll Everywhere questions. If you have additional questions, please put them in the chat, and then at the end of each case, I can ask the questions. So now, without further ado, Dr. Tinga, please take it away. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the SSR for putting on these seminars. I think they're really incredible. And thank you to Dr. Bradella for that very kind invitation. Um, welcome to everybody. And thank you so much for giving up your Wednesday evening, spend an hour with us. So this is going to be a brief talk on the approach to hip MRI. It's basically impossible to cover everything in an hour, but what I hope we'll be able to get through is reviewing the normal anatomical structures in hip MRI, develop a pattern at looking a, develop a pattern of looking at these images and then discuss the indications for MRI versus MR arthrogram. And finally, using cases, we'll highlight some examples of common pathology at the hip. So if you're looking at a routine MRI sequence, most institutions will have a variation on this theme of sequences. So at Sunnybrook, we have a large field of view coronal T2 fat set image. This allows you to see the whole of the pelvis. We have a similar axial T1 non fat set image, again, showing you majority of the pelvis. And then we have three planar small field of view images of the hip of interest. The axial PD images that we acquire are axial to the pelvis and not to the femoral neck. So on occasions where the surgeon is very interested in the labrum or is interested in the presence of a cam lesion, we will acquire this uh, axial oblique sequence. So I don't know if you can see the reference lines, I hope so, but these are acquired oblique along the full length of the femoral neck. So they're oblique, they're axial to the femoral neck, oblique to the pelvis. Looking at MR orthograms, so remember gadolinium is T1 bright. So once you've instilled gadolinium into the hip, most of our imaging is done as a T1 fat sat uh, sequence, whether it's the coronal, sagittal, or that axial oblique sequence. But we also acquire a T2 fat sat image of the hip of interest. The reason being that on the T1 fat saturated images, you're not going to be able to appreciate any bone marrow edema or any changes in the surrounding musculature or structure. So you need a fluid sensitive, a true fluid sensitive sequence that doesn't rely on gadolinium. So when do you decide to use a 3T MRI versus MRA? So that MRA being the MR orthograms. And these are just some uh, numbers from the literature. So looking at hip labral tears, which is a predominant reason for doing MRIs in the past, you can see that MR arthrograms had a sensitivity of about 87% compared to 3T MRI, which is a little bit less, about 81%. Looking at all MRIs, so that would include your one Tesla, your 1.5 Tesla magnets, the sensitivity drops dramatically to about 66%. So really your conversation here is between an MR arthrogram and a 3T MRI when you're looking at intraarticular pathology. When you look at hip chondral lesions, Again, looking at the sensitivity, overall 3T MRI performs better than MR arthrograms. Although if you break down the data from all the studies that were included in this review, you can see that for acetabular lesions, 
MR autogram offers slightly higher, well, not slightly higher, it does offer higher specificity than the 3T MRI. But given that overall 3T performs pretty well in terms of sensitivity and specificity for both femoral and acetabular lesions, it makes sense that majority of our routine imaging on the hip is done as just a standard 3T MRI. This doesn't require the presence of a radiologist. It doesn't require any additional intervention or time for the patient. So it's a pretty good place to start. And then if you need to problem solve, you can go on to an MR autogram. Having said that, if the patient has had any form of surgery, then our routine practice is to go straight to MR autograms. So if they've had a scope, a label repair, con um, a treatment of a cam lesion with bone taken away, then you want to look at an MR autogram because I think the problem solving capacity is a little bit better. So how do I approach my hip MRIs? Um, I use an inside out approach. Uh, you'll meet lots of different people who have lots of different templates and ways of reporting these. So you know, take what works for you. But I basically go from the labrum and then I'll look at the cartilage and the subchondral bone. Then I'll move on to look at the synovium and the capsule of the hip. Then I'll look at the tendons and the muscles around the hip. And then I'll go back and I'll look at my large field of view images, just making sure I've looked at everything else, the pelvis, the bones, the muscle, SI joints, anything else in the field of view. And always remember to look at your scout images as well. So just reviewing some of that normal anatomy. So here are zoomed in images of two different hips. So the first two images on screen left are of a routine 3T MRI. And then screen right, these two images are from an arthrogram. If you're looking at the labrum, so on the coronal images, the part of the labrum that you see is often referred to as the supralateral labrum. You want to see a relatively dark structure. Doesn't matter if you're looking at T2, PD, or T1 images. You want it to be a nice triangular structure. Um, it's T1 dark, T2 dark. Same thing on your T1 fat set images in the setting of an autogram. You want to see a dark labrum maintaining that triangular shape. There's some variation in the shape of the labrum, but this is a good place to start if you're looking at an MRI for the first time. The labrum is immediately adjacent to the cartilage. So that line that you see there, that is sort of intermediate signal intensity comprises the acetabular and the femoral head cartilage. So again, you can see the on the 3T images, particularly the PD sequences, you get very good resolution of the labrum compared to T2 fat set. And then on the, pardon me, sorry, on the arthrograms, again, you can see this dual layer of cartilage, so acetabular and femoral cartilage forming an interface. And here you can appreciate that there's some increased focal T1 signal intensity in the arthrogram. So that's what a cartilage defect or an area of cartilage thinning can look like. There are a number of variants that happen at the chondrolabral junction, which are normal. And additionally, looking at the acetabular cartilage, that's a whole other talk in itself, but it's just something to be aware that you get uh, normal variants in these regions. So once you've looked at your cartilage, the next thing you'll interrogate is your subchondral bone. So this is this condensation of cortex that you get immediately adjacent to the cartilage. And you can imagine if you have cartilage pathology, you'll start to get reactive changes in the subchondral bone. This is also the interface that we're looking at when we're thinking about subchondral fractures. This is the part of the bone when you're thinking about AVN. This is the part of the bone that is affected when you're looking at degenerative changes in whatever joint you're looking at. So the subchondral bone is what I look at next. So moving on, I'll think about the synovium and the capsule. So these are large field of view images and I've zoomed it up here. Generally, a synovium should be pretty thin, uniform all the way around. The fluid in the hip is T2 bright, but it should be quite bland fluid. It doesn't matter how much you window it. You don't want to see any fronds, any areas of hypertrophy. And if you start to see that, you're thinking about synovitis. In the same vein, you're looking at intraticular bodies, some of which may be bits of synovium that have fallen off or intraticular mineralized bodies. So I look at all of that when I'm looking at the synovium and the capsule. For in the shoulder, you have the entity of adhesive capsulitis. Some people report that in the hip. I'm less confident doing that because we don't get enough clinical data. But any pericapsular edema is important to mention in your reports because it signifies that there's some pathology happening there. So moving on to the tendons around the hip, there are a lot of tendons. So this is going to be a very quick 
review just on axial images. We don't have time to go through all the sequences and all the planes. But if you're right at the top of the uh, of the pelvis here, at the anterior superior iliac spine, so that's anteriorly here, you have the attachment of the sartorius muscle and the inguinal ligament. Next slice down, you have the anterior inferior iliac spine, which is basically your acetabular roof, that most anterior margin of the acetabular roof. And that's usually, that's where your rectus femoris comes off. Remember, this has a direct head, which comes off directly anteriorly, an indirect head, which comes off the lateral margin of that acetabular roof. And these come together to form a tendon slip. Now, there are two components of the tendon slip. The indirect head forms the central component of the tendon, and the direct head will form the superficial component, which is inseparable from the, myofasc uh, from the fascia overlying the rectus femoris muscle. Moving further and freely, your next landmark will be your greater trochanter. So that's where the gluteal tendons attach. Anteriorly, you have your gluteus minimus, and posteriorly, you have your gluteus medius. And I like to think of this as mimicking the greater tuberosity in the shoulder. So this anterior structure, I would equate to your supraspinatus and posteriorly here to your infraspinatus. So when you're doing ultrasound, the rotational movement that you have in the shoulder can also be used at the greater trochanter to look at these tendons. Posteriorly here, you can see this is the obturator internus muscle and you have its tendon, which is extra pelvic here. And that just gives you a nice little window, a place to look for the short external rotators. So those are your supra and inferior gemelli, your piriformis tendon and the obturator internus tendon here. Immediately anterior to the hip, adherent to the capsule, you have your iliopsoas tendon. So that's the most anterior structure here. And as you come down further, you can follow that iliopsoas tendon as it tracks down towards the lesser trochanter. Here you're starting to see the ischial tuberosity, the origin of your common hamstring origins, remembering that medially is your conjoint tendon of semitendinosus and biceps femoris. And then, pardon me, sorry, uh, this lateral attachment here is your semimembranosus. And in the proximal third of the um, thigh, those tendons will swap around so that your semimembranosus ends up lying medial to your biceps femoris. And clearly here, you've got your adductor tendon. You don't see very much of it on a hip MRI because we don't cover enough and we're not on the right plane. But you can always look at it, at least on that oblique image, and just, you know, even if it's not a dedicated athletic pubalgia or adductor tendon um, study, you always have at least the ipsilateral hip, so you can look at that tendon there. Okay, and then everything else. So here you're thinking about all your muscles, your tendons, the rest of the bones. But I put these two images here just to highlight the nerves around the hip that you should always be thinking about. So posteriorly here, this is your sciatic nerve. It lies very close to your hamstring tendons. So you can imagine any pathology there, a burst of very severe tendinosis can cause irritation of that sciatic nerve. And clearly here, these tiny dots here are the are components of the femoral nerve. Often you have to follow them back into the pelvis and then scroll down to see. Distal to this, you probably lose resolution and don't appreciate them very well, but this is the area that you're looking for the nerve to sit in. On this more inferior slice here, this is the obturator frame in here, and you can see these small structures here. So that's your obturator neurovascular bundle. Again, here anteriorly, you're seeing components of the femoral nerve. And I just wanted to point at this area here, immediately medial to obturator internus, so your pelvic sidewall. That forms Alcox canal, and your pudendal nerves run through there. So you don't see them individually, but you can imagine if you have pathology in that area, it could cause irritation of the nerves. So patients presenting with deep pelvic pain and you can't find anything anywhere else, you might think about doing a pudendal study or a nerve study to look at those nerves. So this is just a very quick look at everything else in the hip, but I just wanted to focus on the nerves because I don't think we look at that very often. So very quick run through of the normal anatomy around the hip. And I think now we'll look at these structures again, but using cases just to see if we can highlight some common pathology. So just a quick reminder for everybody to get onto poll everywhere. We'll try and make this as interactive as possible. I will be very quick. We'll probably spend about 30 seconds in each case before we move on, just so that we have enough time for discussion um, and answering any questions that you might have in the chat. Okay, so here's the first case. 
I'm hoping you can see the options there, but basically it is, is there any abnormality? And if so, what side is it on? Okay. Maybe another five, 10 seconds. Okay, so that's pretty good, tear of the right labrum. So I purposely left off the side marker on the sagittal image because it makes it too easy. But I hope you can all appreciate the fluid signal, which tracks all the way along the base of the labrum, separating it from the underlying bone. So that's a labral tear. On the coronal images on the right side, you can see you've lost that nice black triangular structure. So there's heterogeneity of the labrum itself. So you've got some intrasubstance abnormality there as well. And these small T2 hyperintense areas are probably representing some prilabral cyst formation or some subcortical cystic change in that labrum, sorry, in the adjacent acetabulum. You can contrast that to the very normal looking triangular structure of the left, left labrum there. There's probably a little bit of bright signal, but it doesn't go all the way across. So this might be one of those normal variants that we we're talking about a sublabral recess. Okay, so moving on, and the cases are sort of grouped together. So um, please feel free to ask your questions and then we'll try and answer them together. So here's another case. Okay, so. So again, we'll wait and see if we get some responses here, okay? okay it's another five seconds before we move on. Okay, so this is a purposely, a purposefully tricky question. The first thing you need to, to appreciate is these are T1 fat saturated images. So the fact that you have bright fluid in the joint tells you that this is an autogram. That means by default, you can't comment on whether or not there's an effusion because we've done something to this patient. We've introduced joint and in, we've introduced fluid in, into the joint. So that's the wrong answer. So if you look at this arrow at the anterior aspect of the hip, I, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, that shows you a paralabral cyst. It has a sort of similar signal characteristics to the gadolinium, it's bright in T1. You can see that area of cartilage thinning there, which is probably arising from the femoral head. So you've got a bit of a cartilage defect there. Again, on the axial oblique images, you can see you've lost, you've, you have some gadolinium tracking into the substance of the anterior labrum here. So that again, confirms the labral tear, your paralabral cyst. And I hope that my arrow here is trying to point to a very small cartilage fissure as well on this part of the femoral head. So it's very, very subtle. These can be very easy to miss, but anywhere where you can see bright T2, sorry, bright signal on a T1 fat set image should make you think that you've got a cartilage defect with gadolinium pulling in there. So the answer here would be large effusion because you can't really call this an effusion. We've introduced that fluid into the hip joint. Here are just some other examples of a very subtle chondral fissure, again, on an MR autogram. So I hope you can appreciate that there's a subtly increased signal intensity here on this T1 fat set image. So again, we think that there's a small cartilage defect with uh, gadolinium pooling in that area. And again, there's probably a small defect in the surface of the femoral cartilage here with a small volume of gadolinium tracking into, into the substance of the cartilage there. Now, remember when you're looking at labral tears, the next thing your surgeon is going to ask you is, does this patient have a predisposition to developing a labral tear? And one of the things that we most commonly think about is looking at CAM lesions is very popular in the literature, very popular in reports and patients know about them because they Google. So here's an example of a patient with a very 
distinct um, cam lesions. So what we're talking about is bony irregularity to the femoral head neck junction. So you get this bump here and that predisposes the patients to labral tears, particularly when they're abducting. How do we measure alpha angles? You've all heard about them. Um, so you draw a circle of best fit on the femoral head. You'll then draw a line that tracks along the femoral neck to the center of the femoral head. And then you look for where the femoral head neck junction comes out of that circle of best fit. And that's where you're gonna put your second line and you're measuring this angle here. In the literature, the normal angle, the range is given as between 55 and 60 degrees. I have to say that I don't routinely measure this in my practice. Our surgeons prefer to do their own calculations and sometimes they'll do them on CT. But if you're asked to measure a cam angle, then you want to be on a true axial oblique, so true axial image to the femoral neck, which is that axial oblique image that we talked about earlier. And that's how you're going to get your, ma your measurement. There are other forms of impingement that are not between the femur and the acetabular. So this is an example of femoral acetabular impingement. You can get acetabular over coverage and pincer impingement. You can get super acetabular impingement, but I think those are beyond the scope of this talk. But just to be aware that there are other forms of impingement that you can get at the hip. This is just the one that we think about and we hear about most commonly. Okay, so we're moving on to the next case here. Okay, so I'll give you a few seconds to look at the images. Okay. Sorry, I think one of my option slide may have disappeared. I apologize. Hopefully you all get it right now that you've seen the answer. Great. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so this is just, this is a very old MRI, um, but you can see in the coronal stir images, we don't obtain these anymore because you get very poor spatial resolution, but you can see that there is a subtle condensation of that subchondral bone, but you have all this edema, which is tracking down towards the intertrochanteric region. On the T1 images, again, you're not seeing the subchondral bone that well. There's a little bit of flattening here but you can see the better resolution on the sagittal T2 fat side images that show you that uh, flattening of the femoral head contour there. And then you can see the subchondral bone marrow edema. So I always say, if, you, if I see edema that's tracking towards the intertrochanteric region, I'm going to look at the images very, very, very carefully looking for that subchondral fracture. Whatever the patient's pathology is, you just want to be sure that you've looked at all the sequences and all the images looking for a very subtle subchondral fracture. Okay, so we'll move on to the next case here. Okay, we'll give another 10 seconds to look at Get your responses in. Okay, so the correct answer here was bilateral avascular necrosis with a subchondral fracture on the left. So remember, avascular necrosis on imaging, we're looking for that demarcation of subchondral bone. It often retains its fat T signal intensity on MRI, but it's outlined by the sapiginous line here that has both T2 hyper and hyper intense demarcation. So that double line that you think about to tell you that it's AVN. The patient also has the same pathology here, but as we talked about before, you can see all of that edema tracking towards the in, uh, intertrochanteric line. So now you're looking, as we talked about, you're looking for that subchondral fracture. You can't see it on the coronal T1 images, but if you look along the anterior aspect of the femoral head, you can see that there's now fluid tracking at that subchondral bone there. So you've got a subchondral fracture in addition to the AVN. There are multiple classifications um, for looking at the severity of AVN, but this would be basically a grade three or four where you're starting to worry about a fragment becoming unstable and the patient might need some form of surgical intervention. In and of itself, in the early stages of AVN, uh, bone marrow edema is not a significant feature. When it is there, it's often associated with pain. So whenever I see this, even though I know the patient has AVN, I wouldn't say, okay, AVN, bone marrow edema, done. I will make sure that I've looked for that subchondral fracture. 
Here's just uh, an example of a patient with osteoarthrosis who managed to slip through, didn't have an x-ray and went straight to MR arthrogram. So this is what OA looks like in an arthrogram. You've got complete thinning of that cartilage over the femoral head, complete loss of cartilage over the acetabulum. The labrum looks grossly abnormal. You've got separation of the labrum from the underlying bones. So that's your supralateral labrum. Your anterior superior labrum looks exactly the same. You've got some gadolinium tracking into a subchondral cyst in the acetabulum. And on your T2 images, you can appreciate that subchondral cystic change much better than on the T1 fat set images. And you can see the edema in the acetabulum. So this is just stress reaction. You've lost all your cartilage and your shock absorber capacity at the hip. So that's what OA looks like. So when you think about your subchondral bone, sometimes this can look very dramatic and you're worried that something more is going on, but it depends on the severity of the degenerative change. Okay, so we'll move on to the next case here. So there's a few images. I'll give you a little bit of time to look at them. Okay, oh, I hope that hasn't done that again. Um, give me some time to respond. Okay. So PVNS, so not uncommon in the hip. I think the most critical thing is appreciating the bony erosion on the x-ray. If you don't see it, you might report this as normal and the patient won't get to MRI for one, two, three years, sometimes depending on the severity of their hip pain. So you really want to look for this chronic erosion and mechanical remodeling of the femoral head and femoral neck contours due to a tight synovium. And then that will prompt you to get your MRI. And you can see that the synovium is thickened. There's a heterogeneous signal. If this is fluid, you'd expect it to be similar to the bladder signal. And then you can see here on the T2 fat side, you appreciate that synovial mass much more clearly. We didn't get great in echo images, but you'd want to see some blooming artifact if you did, although in the hip, it tends to be less dramatic than you get in the knee. I think just these patients present a little bit early and don't have as much hemorrhage happening in the hip before then. So that's a nice example of PVNS. Um, and here's a different case. Okay. okay, another five seconds before we move in, get your answers in. Okay. So this is actually a case of chondromatosis, although I do think that rice bodies would be an acceptable alternative here. So unfortunately, we don't have radiographs of, for this patient, but they did have an external CT that is beyond, we're not, no longer able to retrieve it. That did not show any mineralization at the hip. But what you can see here is they're very small bodies, which are of regular size in the hip. You've got this chronic pressure erosion of the femoral neck and the femoral head on both sides. So you know it's a longstanding process. And um, so the differential for this was chondromatosis or rice bodies. But there was not a lot of damage to the cartilage of the joint or um, the no marginal erosions. And I often think as rice bodies happening in situations, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis. So there was no sign of an underlying inflammatory arthropathy here. So we went for primary chondromatosis and the patient had a biopsy and surgery that confirmed it. But it's always important to think about uh, rice bodies as an alternative here. If it is mineralized in x-rays or CT, then you'd call it osteochondromatosis. But we know that a percentage of these... Um, might have no mineralization and you only see them on MRI. Okay, so lipoma aberrescence is a common choice here. So here's an example of a patient who presented with what we thought was chondromatosis. So we could see all this mineralization projected over the femoral neck. We're very excited. Patient came to MRI. Unfortunately, this corresponded to this very large singular intraticular body at the anterior aspect of the hip. We think possibly from trauma as a child. 
And this is causing chronic irritation of the synovium at the hip. So we had fatty hypertrophy of the synovium here. You can see this is a T1 image, the uh, synovial hypertrophy, T1 bright, and the saturation of that signal on the PD fat set sequences. So lipoma aborescence, very rare in the hip, much more common in the knee where you have a large uh, capacious joint. You can have chronic processes. But you can have it primarily, but often it occurs when you have a chronic synovial irritation or chronic synovial pathology and you get this fatty hypertrophy of the synovium. So just an example of lipoma arborescence to keep in your mind. Okay, so moving on. Just a couple of images here. Okay, about another five seconds. This is an easy one. Okay, so you all got it. Ilyasa was versa. You can see the fluid at the anterior aspect of the hip and then on the inferior slice, it's surrounding the iliopsoas tendon. The reason I put the paralabral cyst here is it's a common point of confusion, especially if you don't have the fluid tracking inferiorly. You can see how close that bursa sits to the labrum. So it's very easy to overcall or to mistake this for a paralabral cyst and call an underlying labral tear. So you've got to really look at this carefully, see if the fluid is more surrounding the iliopsoas tendon or if it's actually in relation to the labrum and use all the um, planes of imaging that you have to make that decision. Okay, so this will require a little bit more activity in your part. Um, you should be able to type out the tendons Hopefully. Okay. Okay, so give me another ten seconds. Okay, so you're all doing very well. You basically got the right combination of tendons here. So this is an example of a very high grade, really full thickness tear of the gluteus minimus here. You've got a little bit of tendon stump hanging around. And then you can see the gluteus med minimus, sorry, which is anterior is also very abnormal. It's thickened, abnormal signal. There is some intrasubstance fluid there. So you've also got partial tearing of that gluteus minimus and a background of tendinosis and a high grade essentially full thickness tear of your gluteus medius. And this is just an example of a coronal image taken at that level there. So this is a very unlucky patient who'd had two or three greater trochanteric bursal injections with no prior imaging. And this was a result when she came to us. So we sent it to MRI. We, we saw this in Alchon and sent it to MRI to confirm it. And you can see there's all this fluid in the overlying greater trochanteric bursa. Now, I don't know if the injections caused the injection or she caused the tears or she was just very unlucky and had pathology there to begin with, but you, you, know, you always want to be looking for the tear before you do any intervention around the hip. She had very abnormal tendons everywhere else. So if you look at the slice below, you could see that her iliopsoas tendon was thickened, heterogeneous signal. You had this fluid surrounding the tendon, although not a discrete burst as we'd seen before. So we call this a peritendinitis. She also had mildly increased signal in her hamstring tendons. We see this commonly, but we call the tendinosis, and they can clinically correlate to see if she had any pain. Although I have to say that on most MRIs, we'll see a little bit of signal within the common hamstring tendons, which is probably just mechanical. Here's another patient who came for an MRI for hip pain. There's not much going on in the hip. But what we noticed was the adducted tendon, which sits anteriorly, was thickened. You can see the fluid signal in it. It's occupying greater than 50% of the visible tendon. So this is at least a moderate to high grade tear. It's very hard to correlate that on the coronal images because you're right at the anterior aspects, you know, the one uh, the last couple of slices before. But you could see that on the contralateral side, it's a little bit heterogeneous, but there's no true fluid signal. Um, as opposed to at the left common adductor origin. So she's got a high grade intrasubstance tear there. And then we recommended that the patient had a dedicated athletic revulger protocol, which unfortunately was done somewhere else. 
Here's another example of an adducted tear. This is on an MR autogram. So the patient's hip was normal and someone picked up that the adducted tendon anteriorly here was very thickened. Now it's difficult to comment in a T1 fat set because we're not getting that fluid signal. But on the T2 fat set images, you could see that there's a lot of edema in the adductor regions on both sides, even in the bone. The patient had had a split injury. She's doing the splits and fell. And so we got an additional T2 fat set image. It looks a little bit odd here. The signal looks abnormal. And it's just remember that gadolinium does cause T2 shortening. So you will get some brightening of the signal, but you could still appreciate that that common adductor origin there is thickened with a normal signal. So we call this an intrasubstance tear and the patient went on to have an athletic pubology protocol, which is dedicated to look at the adductor tendons and it confirmed the presence of that tear. Okay, here's an example of a patient who had very abnormal looking common hamstring tendon. You can see that there's fluid tracking between the tendon origins, fluid surrounding both components of the tendon. So this is a patient who had tendinosis with intrasubstance tearing and bursitis. And you can see that tear a little bit better here on the coronal sequences. You can see the fluid tracking into the tendon. So just a nice example here of common hamstring tendinosis tear and bursitis. I hope you can all see that the sciatic nerve sits very close to that common hamstring tendon there. So you can imagine this pathology will be causing irritation of that nerve there. Okay, so we'll move on to the next case. We've only got about three cases left, so hopefully we should finish in time and have some time for discussion. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move on here. Excellent. So majority of you said bilateral ischiofemoral impingement. Uh, remember ischiofemoral impingement. This is a uh, mechanical um, compression of the muscles that sit in this space that's between the medial edge of the lesser trochanter. Sorry, yeah, the medial edge of the lesser trochanter and the lateral edge of your ischial tuberosity. So this is your ischiofemoral space here. This is your quadratus femoris interval posteriorly here, which is between the lesser trochanter and the hamstring origins. And the literature says that as this gets narrow, you get that mechanical impingement in the musculature. The measurements differ, but usually about 12 to 13 millimeters is significantly narrowed. But often you don't see that, and yet you see this edema and the patient has clinical signs of ischiofemoral impingement. So even though the space is not narrowed, but you have true edema, don't hesitate to suggest that it might be a possibility and they can assess the patient clinically. On the contralateral side, it was very difficult to decide if we thought there's edema or not, because you can see the vessels are here and you've got some uh, pulsation artifacts, but I think there is true edema here. More importantly, you can see that there's a bursa overlying um, the quadratus femoris muscle there. So you've got bursitis, which to me often says, yes, there's definitely impingement. Once you're forming an adventitial bursa, there's something mechanical going on there. So we diagnose bilateral issue femoral impingement in this patient. Okay, so we'll go through the last three cases here. So another one where you have to type, actually all the last three cases you need to type. Okay. I'll buy that you're all getting this right. So we'll move on. Yeah, excellent. So bilateral sacroiliitis, young patient presenting with nonspecific hip pain. You've got to think about your ankylosing spondylitis, your IBD related sacroiliitis. If it was a woman who's been recently pregnant, maybe pregnancy induced sacroiliitis, although that's usually not as symmetric here. So patient came for hip pain, no hip pain, but their problem is posterior. And it just highlights, remember to look at every single sequence and every single image you have. Okay, here's another example. So again, just have a little think about what you think is going on here. <laughs> 
Okay, so yep, that's exactly right. So your T1 images here show diffuse replacement of the bone marrow. Remember that your reference, if you're looking um, so extra extra spinal, my reference is often the adjacent muscle. So if the signal and the bone is less than that, then you know you've got replacement of the marrow. Very helpfully here, you have some retained fatty marrow just to the tip of the greater trochanter to help you see what it looked like. It's difficult in the T2 fat set images, and often if you only have these, you can miss it. But you've got the actual images here again that also confirm that process. So this is an elderly patient who had an arthroplasty presented with imaging for the right hip because they had right hip pain. And this is their first diagnosis of a marrow infiltrative process that turned out to be CML. You don't forget to look at your marrow. Okay, and then this is a final case. Okay, yeah, that's exactly right. So there's a lipoma here in the posterior aspect of the hip. It's sitting deep to the um, gluteus maximus muscle here, very close to the sciatic nerve, but the nerve shows completely normal signal, completely incidental, didn't have any worrying features. So we mentioned it, it's going to be followed up, but there's nothing really to be done. But the patient at least could feel a lump and we found a reason for that. So always remember to look for musculature, sorry, soft tissue pathology outside of the muscles and tendons at the hip. Here's just another example of a patient who had hip pain. You can see that there's a hernia there on subsequent MRIs, which are done elsewhere. He actually had some incarceration and edema of the fat, but he was being treated with physiotherapy for hip pain and his problem was actually his hernia. So just going back to the case that I showed you way earlier when we we're looking at the tendons, I would hope that you all spotted the fact that this patient had an, an, a very large amount of pelvic free fluid. Um, we couldn't explain it in the imaging, so she went to ultrasound scanning and we haven't seen anything from there. So hip was completely normal, but I think she, and uh, actually, I did actually look at her clinical note today and the patient had PID. So came in as hip pain, completely normal, but pelvic free fluid diagnosed with PID. Okay, so that's just a really quick run through about sort of summarizing the normal anatomy of some of the structures at the hip, developing a pattern of looking at hip MRIs. We've talked a little bit about MRI versus MRA and looked at some examples of common pathology. We haven't covered everything. There's so much to look at at the hip. You could look at infection, you could look at postoperative cases, arthroplasty, but I think this is just a good place for you to start to go and interrogate the literature and have a way to look at cases um, in your practice. Great, fantastic, Angela. This was such a great overview about everything in the hip. I think it was extremely complete and great questions. There were a couple of questions in the Q&A that pertain specifically to the um, technique. So okay. th there were two um, sequences to just, if you could go over MR arthrograms and then do we need a T1 non-fat set sequence in an MR arthrogram to look for bone marrow? Okay, so, um, so MR arthrogram, remember you're instilling deleted gadolinium in the hip. So majority of our sequences will be T1 non-fat saturated images. Because these are specifically done to just the hip, we don't do non-fat saturated images. We will just do a T2 fat set, but different institutions will have different protocols. And it's usually, you're thinking about timing versus yields uh, of the information. So it doesn't hurt to do a non-T1 fat set, but we don't routinely do them. Okay, thank you. We actually do always do a non-fat set T1 yeah. for the marrow because we have we see a lot of tumor cases, even in the okay. unsuspected ones that yeah. are they always turn up. Um, another question came in for fatty containing masses deeper in the muscle compartment or in the pelvis. Will you ever suggest it is an atypical fat containing mass? So st statistically likely representing a lipoma, but liposarcoma would be hard to exclude. Or do you suggest follow up? So this varies. I worked at a tumor center prior to this, and they really didn't like us saying cannot exclude liposarcoma. Because your question is, if it's completely fatty and completely saturates out and you don't see any abnormally thick and septations and nodularity, it's 
a lipoma. If you start to see a little bit of septations, maybe you think, okay, it's an atypical lipoma, but it's predominantly fatty. An atypical lipoma and a well-differentiated liposarcoma, liposarcoma have the same treatment. And usually it's just excision of the whole mass as a whole because the sampling error when you biopsy is extremely high. So what they'll do if it looks a little bit atypical, they'll take it out. Your key thing, what you want to look for is a very abnormal looking lipoma. So if it has a lot of nodularity and you're starting to think about a de-differentiated lipoma, then those the surgeons are interested in. So I don't tend to say cannot exclude liposarcoma. I'll just say there's a fatty mass with no atypical features, most in keeping with the lipoma. It happens to be in the deep compartment. You can follow it up if it changes. I will base that on the patient's age, but I don't tend to put liposarcoma or say I can't exclude liposarcoma because it's not very helpful. It causes panic for the patient and it doesn't really take anyone anywhere else. You go to see the surgeon, they say, well, it looks bland. If it grows bigger, it changes, then we'll take it out, so. Great, great um, answer to a sometimes challenging question, and we do yeah. exactly the same. Our tumor surgeons do not like if we say can't exclude liposarcoma. Yeah. Another question just came in. How do you, it's also a really, really good one. How do you differentiate labral tear from sublabral recess if the high signal does not completely go through the labral base? So this is a really tough one, and it's 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 very difficult. So on 3T MRI, I will I will say there's a little bit of fluid with partial chondral labral separation. I wouldn't use the word tear unless I see intrasubstance signal. The reason being the surgeon understands what that means. And if the patient has clinical signs that would fit to the labral tear, then he can say, look, this looks like a tear and we'll treat it. But we see so much signal just undermining the base of the labrum, even in the normal asymptomatic population that you don't want to call everything a tear. So I'll say there might be a little bit of chondrolabral separation versus a sublabral tear clinical correlation. If the patient is very tender or if the patient's a candidate for surgery, then the surgeon will bring them back to get an MR autogram. That, I don't know. That goes with, with the next questions right on topic. Um, first of all, thank you for the great talk. Very precise and excellent cases. Do you include recommendation to consider steroid injections, for example, trochanteric bursitis? And how often do you recommend MR athogram on a possible labral tear on 1.5T or get uh, ortho consult before getting an MR athogram in a community setup? So two excellent questions. Maybe you can answer the labral first and then we can talk about the steroid okay, injections. So the label tear. Um so if I will say if the patient has clinical signs that could suggest a labral tear, consider MR arthrogram if it to change management. Unfortunately, what happens is family practice physicians will see that and just get the MR arthrogram anyway. And it's it's a little bit of a balance. We end up doing more than we should. Um, for the surgeons, actually, they don't go to MR arthrogram that often um, because often they'll say, well, I wasn't doing the MRI for a label tear. If I was, I would have told you and you'd have done it as a specific 3T radial images if you get them or with oblique images. So if they weren't worried about a label tear, they'll ignore it. They, they don't respond to every single word you put. Family physicians, we end up getting a lot of MR arthrograms. I think it's difficult. You don't want to not report what you're seeing. You've got to report accurately. And then we don't examine the patient. So I don't also want to be dismissive. If they've examined them, but just haven't given us the information, it at least gives them an option of, of where to go. I don't recommend injections, though. I will leave that to them to decide clinically ever. Whether it's, I'll say there's stroke enteric bursitis, that is up to the clinician to decide if they want them or not. Great. Thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat while people are still thinking. Um, I have a couple of questions. You showed really nice examples of the AVN and the subchondral fracture. Um, sometimes it's not that easy. It's and then so we have the transient yeah. osteoporosis of the yeah. hip, if you believe in that. So can you talk a little bit how to differentiate maybe the two or three entities? Um, okay. on. So I am very reluctant to use the term transient osteoporosis of the hip. Um, I will describe the edema and I will spend a very long time looking for that subchondral fracture. And I will say, look, there's edema tracking to the femoral neck. I can't see a subchondral fracture. If it's done on 1.5 and it's a young patient, I'll say, look, I favor this. There might be an occult subchondral fracture here because then at least the surgeon will offload the patient, will make them a little bit non-weight bearing, protects them. They might repeat the MRI in three months. If it's an elderly patient, you know, usually you can get subchondral fractures even in the setting of OA. So that I will say, look, there's a lot of edema. I can't see a definite fracture, but this could be transient osteoporosis or an occult subchondral fracture. 
avian and subchondral fractures are very, very tricky, especially in the early stages, because you might get that edema and you don't see it. Repeat MRI is not a bad thing because you can do a very limited quick sequence to look for it. Um, sometimes if you're really, really struggling, I will get a CT. We'll sometimes get a CT to see if we can see any of that curvilinear subchondral sclerosis that follows the shape of the femoral head. Whereas AVN, you want to see the serpiginous line, but over time it will it become presenteric. It's almost anti the femoral head. It's, you know, sort of C-shaped in the opposite direction, but it's very, very difficult. So if you're not sure, I'd say, look, this could be early AVN, this could be a subchondral fracture. Are they going to do anything about it operatively? No, they might treat the patient differently. If they have risk factors for AVN, they'll try and alleviate those and then they'll repeat the MRI and you can differentiate between the two. So it's, it's not always clear cut. Right. These are the you. best examples I could find. You know, they were beautiful. Absolutely. I was like, yeah, that is pretty clear cut. Easy, but it's in yeah. real life, not always that easy. Yeah. And you just um, emphasize sometimes it can be difficult. Yeah. Um, you also mentioned in your talk, which I really love you, that well, this, when you talked about the initial, like going over a case, adhesive capsulitis or capsulitis of the hip, that's something we now sometimes hear in some yeah. media. There are no real guidelines. What, what's your take on, on that capsulitis of the hip? So I'm I'm not very confident in calling it because I, I don't think we have enough literature there. Often what I will think about is if I see pericapsular edema, but not a hip joint effusion, because to me, pericapsular edema always makes me worry. The first thing I've got to think about is there any chance this could be infection? So once you're seeing any inflammation, any stranding around the capsule, you're starting to worry about infection. If I'm not seeing an effusion, no marrow change, it's, look, there's some pericapsular edema. It's difficult to say if this is thickened or not clinical correlation for any limited range of motion or stiffness. And I leave it at that. I don't use the term uh, adhesive capsulitis. Some of my colleagues do, but I'm, I don't think the surgeons like it because there's not much they can do about it. And I don't think we have real evidence for it. I don't know what you, what you think. I, I agree. I, I don't use it, but I hear it at meetings once in a while. Yeah. Like people are talking yeah. about it and I agree. We probably have to do some more research and yeah. maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't. Another question just came in. HSS doesn't use athograms. What are your thoughts on that? Is it necessary? Controversial um, question? <laughs> Anonymous attending? <laughs> <laughs> one. Uh, I did my fellowship and we didn't do a lot of orthograms to be honest and even when I did my residency we didn't do a lot of orthograms so I was very used to looking at MR uh, MR just standard 3T MRIs I think if you have a good scanner it doesn't hurt to try 3T MRI this intervention at the hip comes with risks you know there's a low risk of infection but it's not negligible and a lot of these MR orthograms you're doing them in young patients so imagine you introduce infection and this patient ends up destroying the cartilage I think even if your surgeons really like MRAs, we're trying to move them away and saying, look, give us a chance. Let us see how the 3T works. Let's give you as much information. If we can't make a decision and we need to problem solve, then by all means, we'll book the patient back and we'll bring them back for an MR autogram. And we tend to organize those ourselves if we're indecisive. But you know, I don't think it, it doesn't hurt to not do them. I think doing a 3T and then having that select indication for doing MR autograms. Postoperatively, our surgeons really like the MR autograms. I don't know that it makes it any better, but they feel a lot more confident in saying we're going to go back into the hip if they have an MR autogram. Do you um, do you assess the pain? It was a lot of our we we wrote this up in skeletal radiology because our um, hip surgeons really want to know whether they got better. So there's almost a two for one because often insurance only pays if you can demonstrate that they had a pain relief with an intraarticular injection. So we in some of well in our arthrograms we now do a little quick physical exam before then we do the arthrogram which always contains some um, anesthetic and yeah. then repeat the um, exam yeah, yeah. and put that in the report. And they often the surgeon think that's more in, more important than whatever we see on the MRI, but would love to hear what you're doing. So I, I don't examine, but I will often ask about pain beforehand. So I'll just do a visual analog scale and say, you know, pain zero, pain 10, when you came in today or in the last week when your pain was at its worst, where was it? And I, I also always inject um, local anesthetic. So for example, in an arthrogram, usually my first injection will be local anesthetic. And once you've done a lot of them, you know when you're in the joint. So that's what I used to test when I'm in the joint. And then I'll connect my, um, my gadolinium. So at that point, I've probably given them maybe a couple of cc of local anesthetic before the gadolinium. And then I'll ask them afterwards, is there any difference in your pain or not? 
about 10 minutes or so after the injection because they, they walk the same way with me towards my office as they're going to MR. I'll ask them, is there any pain better or worse? And then I'll, I'll document that if they tell me. But for us, it doesn't make so much of a difference. The surgeons don't really care. Oh. Half of the time, they don't read our reports, so... Ours care often because they have to demonstrate it yes. for the insurance or yeah. something. So often they, they do care more about that. Than so our standard, like our cortisone injections, I will do, document that more routinely yeah. than for my MRR. Yeah, together. we sometimes also get asked to inject a CC of Canalog at the same time with the yeah. alphogram. Are you getting that? Occasionally, not often, but we have one or two surgeons who do, yeah. Yeah, some do. Um, I think, let's see. Oh, I think something else just came in. Okay. Uh, for a given structure demonstrating AVN, do you measure the surface area involved? Do you reserve the term AVN for articular surfaces and osteonecrosis or infarction for non-articular surfaces? Excellent question. Okay, so I, um, yes, I do. I keep AVN for joint surfaces, infarcts for everywhere else. I don't know what you do. Is that the same? Miriam? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we do the same. Um, yeah. And then, yes, I do try and say, like, I wouldn't be, it, it's hard to be very accurate because you think about a 3D structure when you're looking at measuring, but I will try and give a percentage. So if it's, you know, less than 25, 25 to 50, greater than 50. And usually what I'll do is put the three planes up and see, okay, on the axial, it's probably involving about 30% of the articular surface. So that'll be, and then if it's a little bit bigger on one of them, I'll go with whatever the biggest value is on either of the three planes. But it's, you know, I'll give a range because we're not that accurate and we're not doing volumetric measurements here. But yeah. Yeah, yeah I am actually worse. I say like I'm a small, medium, large. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you're, you're giving them an indication of how bad it is. Yeah. yeah. But I agree, it's hard to give it very accurate. It's more like something like less than 25, 50, exactly. greater than 50. I am very particular about mentioning subchondral fractures though in young yes. patients, because sometimes they will go on to do core decompressions just to try and save that hip if they can. So I do mention that. Absolutely, subchondral fracture is so important. And I think often that's what our surgeon wants to know. That's yes, or no, they often know they have an ABN, but yeah. Okay. Um, Oh, any feedback? Oh, that was Patrick. <laughs> I think we are up here. It's eight o'clock, almost. Thank you all so much. Um, well, Angela, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank it you all for coming. <laughs> fabulous lecture. I also would love to thank the almost 100, more than 100 people at one point. So thanks yeah. so much for spending your evening with us, depending which time zone you are. For me, it's dark outside. Yes. And uh, thanks for the SSR for having this great program. This was really fantastic. All right. Okay. Bye, Good night. Everyone.